Right, so I've woken up the desoldering iron. Got the boffer on. Guys will often uh, talk about lack of fume management as if it's a toughness thing. Uh, people can't control if they've got lung problems or not. So if you're working with people or you've got stuff floating around and customers are coming in and out, um, it's just good to keep the air as clean as you can. At least some effort. Instead of filtering it through a cigarette butt. So if you don't have the size, if I don't, I don't have the size nozzle on, on the gun at the moment to go over that whole pin. I do have one, but uh, you can just sort of push it one way, suck the solder out, push it the other way, suck the solder out, and it all goes away. Magic. And she should just wiggle out. Yep, beauty. So this is uh, what I was talking about. They rely on pretty pissy plastic clips to keep the whole thing together and you can see it's coming apart at the seams there. And the whole thing will probably just, uh, the whole base will probably come out. And it's still holding on pretty well, but yeah, it's something's, someone might have shoved something down the, uh, down the end of the jack or something and it's, it's thrown it out. So once, once this bottom comes out of alignment, the jack, they never quite go back together the same way again. There's always just a bit of a uh, bit of a gap there. So we'll change that out. And we'll put some little wires going to a switchcraft on the front panel. Nice and sturdy, metal thread. So next, I'll just go through and just reflow the pot pins. This is a leaded solder, so no, no real need to clean it all off before reflowing so next I'll go through those uh, filter cap pins that we snipped off from the other side I'll just put, get a bit of flux onto them so the solder doesn't go crusty and then I'll just get tweezers pull out the remainder of the lead so we don't damage the traces. Trying to pull the caps out from the other side, rips the traces off, rips the pads off. There's not a lot you can do then except some Frankenstein type repair that doesn't look great. So now all the leads are gone, the off cuts. Just go through and clean up those pads. So, next we'll modify the bias supply to lower the quiescent power dissipation of the output valves if you want to get technical. So this is a voltage divider. So 33 to 22, that's a direct ratio of uh, what the output voltage will be. You can have a play with it, but that's where that adjustable board from, uh, from Rowan comes in. Uh, I've found somewhere between 22 to 24K is kind of the sweet spot. Um, 22K is on the more conservative side. 24K is probably a bit more ideal um, in some cases. So we'll we'll go with the 22 first, see where that lands us, and uh, if we need to, we can change it. Bear in mind also that these things run the plate a little bit hotter than usual. So if you drop the bias too far, so uh, you pull it back too far, what happens is then the the B plus, which is here, um, that doesn't get as loaded down because there's less current draw from the valve. So then your voltages go up. Now 329 from memory is pretty conservative measurement. It's more like 350-ish because uh, a lot of these amps will say 240 volt when they're actually 
uh, expecting 220 um, to 230. So if you pull the bias back too much, there's less sag on the high tension and then the voltage goes through the roof and then you start playing with fire in terms of uh, the valve data sheet limits. So you sort of, if you want to run it a little bit warmer than, than ideal, like 60% or whatever, uh, that will pull the voltage down a little bit so you'll have less of, uh, less of a risk of arc over inside the valve. That is also the case with many uh, EL84 based amps, like a lot of stuff from Vox and uh, the various <laughs> Vox ripoffs. So I've snipped out R51, which is the top half of the bias divider. That was the 33k. Uh, while we're here, well, we've got the board out. Uh, another thing I like to do is just to avoid future problems is replace all the plate load resistors. So that's uh, one, two, three, four there. Um, they tend to go noisy over time. Oh, sorry. Another one down there. This has got one unused triad. Um, you'll probably uh, have heard elsewhere just like crackling and popping in background, just fluctuating sort of uh, thunderstormy fuzzy noises. Often they come back through the reverb too, more dramatic. That's often caused by the carbon film uh, resistors breaking down. Um, so I tend to replace them in metal film in amps like this. In vintage stuff, I uh, might replace them with carbon film or um, or carbon composite uh, just for the, the vintage thing. But um, generally metal film. Um, I've never had anyone complain about a lower noise floor in a Blues Junior. So... <laughs> So that just avoids any potential uh, comebacks with having to pull the board again and go over it all. All right, so we've removed all the components we're gonna remove from this side. So we'll flip the board over and remove those radial caps and the remainder of the leads from the rest of the components. Again, we'll apply a bit of solder just to gain the advantage of its flux to every joint that we're gonna be working on. Now that's how your solder joints, oh, solder pads, sorry, should look after the components have been removed. No rip pads, no burnt marks, no burnt flux, no marks across the board from where the soldering iron skated across because the bloody tech's got the DTs. Uh, just nice, shiny, and ready for the new components. So we'll hold the board vertical now so I can insert, insert the uh, components from this side and then fold the leads over the other side. Uh, we'll do them all in one go. I'll start with the smaller components first, then get the silicon out to uh, affix the new axial caps. Um, there's only so many times you want to flip this board back and forth before you start having suspect connections on the ribbon cables. You want to really limit it. You don't want to be back and forth, back and forth, or you'll start seeing fraying, or you might even get some breaks. And then you'll have to strip those back and make a new termination on each end. And that's not a trivial task. It's a bit tricky with this stuff. It's pretty thick and heavy, and there's a big webbing between each, uh, each wire. So you've got to cut through with a art knife and be careful not to nick the wire. It's a bit of a pain in the ass, so I'd like to try and avoid that if we can. And just on a side note, I'm not a big fan of the way that Fender mounted these radial caps. The whole point of a radial cap is you can have it hard against the board and then the length of the, the leads themselves being folded over becomes your mechanical strength against the base. These are just floating around about eighth of an inch up in the air, just vibrating. Now this is a combo. This thing pumps about 15 watts of power into that speaker and the whole amp vibrates. And every component vibrates. If you see those uh, mechanical analytical videos where they use a special camera, a high frame rate camera to slow down the wobbles of all the um, industrial hardware to figure out what's causing faults and what's creating standing waves. If you looked at a circuit board under full power in an amp, you'll notice that every single component will be moving to some degree. And you can only, it's like a coat hanger, you can only bend those leads so many times till they snap. And if they don't snap, the solder connection will, particularly in a uh, single-sided 
PCB without through plated holes. All right, so here's all the modifications and uh, upgrades. Got the new filter caps in there. We've got a uh, new Switchcraft shorting jack there. And we've removed the ground to chassis from this end because that's going to be provided via the jack now and a tooth washer. So uh, we've got the metal shaft jack there, so that's, that's going to be more reliable in the long term. We've gone through and made a few component upgrades. So, for example, some uh, ceramic capacitors. We've, we've gone to higher grade, better quality, um, better temperature coefficient, more suitable for a valve amp. Uh, and just better microphonics, that kind of thing. Um, and there's been some value changes to change the voicing on this thing to see how good we can get it as well. So you can see the forest of uh, leads there to be soldered and snipped off. So we've changed quite a bit. The average just repair job on a Blues Junior, when the customer's happy with the sound, is no any of this involved. Um, this one was a mission to see how good we can get it to sound. This is going to be for a studio amp and we kind of want it to blow all the other Blues Juniors out of the water. So normally we don't go this far down the rabbit hole. <laughs> so we've got the boffer going again. We've got the solder sitting somewhere nice and comfy. Let's get soldering. You don't want to sit on each joint too far, too, for too long. So that requires a good quality uh, temperature controlled soldering iron. Everything's soldered, we can go through and snippity do uh, the leads off. Don't let them fly. We're guaranteed to end up in the vent of your oscilloscope or something <laughs> and cause woes and misery. Now, as is customary around here, I'll just put a bit of paper towel inside the chassis and uh, clean up our flux, let it run off. So I'm using 99.997% isopropyl alcohol. The stuff from the hardware store is only 70, there's too much water in it. You want the electronics grade stuff, which is dehydrated. I just like to work a bit on there and just let it sit for a bit, soften it up. Flux can be really, really hard when you are uh, First apply it, but it softens up the longer the uh, alcohol sits on it, dissolves it. Let that sit for a little while, and then we'll use a little bit more to rinse it off. <clears throat> right, then I'll give it a blast with some compressed air. Not too hot, not too high pressure. There's sometimes a little bit of a white residue left after that. So I'll just use a dry brush to sort of buff that off, polish the board a bit. And it looks like uh, from the factory. Beauty. So here's the replacement speaker cable that I've made up. <clears throat> I've just used uh, some nice hookup wire basically, twisted. Uh, a little bit of heat shrink to stop it from unraveling, uh, tin the ends for hard wiring to the speaker and put a little extended piece of heat shrink on the, the jack end so when we crimp this little sort of retainer, they don't do a lot but they do a bit, uh, it won't break through the insulation possibly on the, uh, on the actual wire itself. We've got actual hooked over in each eyelet connections before soldering. And that's an Amphenol right angle mono connector, just nickel. So that should be very reliable. 
compared to the factory cable. And there it is reassembled. Ready to rock for a very long time. Now one thing that shits me a bit about eminent speakers is their terminals are like solder phobic. Um, solder just rolls off them like water off a duck's back. You often have to get in there with some uh, scotch bright or something. I don't know what the deal is, what alloy it's coated with, but whatever it is, solder doesn't take to it. So roughing it up and then using a slightly more aggressive solder. Here I've got Loctite, previously known as Multicore C511, which is a bit more aggressive in the flux, and it tends to break through any surface corrosion a lot easier than your, your sort of regular solder. Uh, and often you'll have to like tin it first before putting the cable through. Just make sure that the solder's got good coverage first, remove that solder, put the lead through, and then actually solder it in place. So it's a bit of stuffing around. I've also got this bit of tape here, just so any flux doesn't spray on the, on the cone, uh, and so no blobs of solder accidentally go and fall down and get stuck to the cone and rattle their way around the basket when you forget about them. So there we go, a nice happy speaker cable. Hard, hard soldered to the uh, speaker and a nice new plug. All right, so I've fired it up on the Variac and made sure there's no catastrophic faults. We've tested that all the voltages are where they should be at a lower input voltage, just to make sure everything's hunky-dory and there's been no mistakes, no broken wires, anything like that. So we'll fire it up now. Sitting at 246 on the mains. Set the watt meter up. <clears throat> she shoots up to about 50 watts, then it settles back down to 30 and it'll start to climb as the valves conduct. A little bit of hum there, but we haven't re-secured the wiring and stuff yet, so we'll check that out. So 46, 47, looks like it's gonna settle around 50 watts. So I've measured the resistance of either side of the output transformer, and it's pretty equal, 98 ohms per side. So we'll measure the plate voltage. Keep the wires over here because these things are prone to a bit of isolation. 336. 336. Plate to cathode. So we'll measure the voltage drop across each side there. 2.67 7 volt. Red to brown. 2.39 volt red to blue. So we'll go red to brown first. 2.67 divided by 98 ohms equals 27.2 milliamp. Multiply that by the plate to cathode voltage of 336 equals 9.15 watt. Divided by 12, which is the data sheet maximum, 76.3%. A little bit warm. On the other side, 2.39 volts divided by 98 ohms equals 24.4 milliamp. Multiplied by 336 plate cathode voltage, 8.19 watt divided by 12. 68.2%. So we're, we're less than 10% out, so they're not a great match on the output valves, but it's not too bad. It's way better than it would have been when it came in. So they'll last a, mu a much longer time. Uh, the screen grid resistor I up to 1.5K, so when you drive these little buggers in overdrive, uh, they won't shorten their life significantly. It'll limit the current to the screen grid. So I was just testing for uh, the rated power output and run into a bit of a problem, feeding it with a one kilohertz signal into an eight ohm load. And she's breaking into oscillation there. Not full on, like not, not completely, but that would manifest itself as a pretty nasty overtones when you push it. Uh, so we'll have a look at the lead dress, see if we're gonna improve that by just rearranging some stuff. Alright, so we've 
how to play with the lead dress, moved ribbons, uh, the ribbon cable down, moved the plate wires around. Uh, nothing really affected it at all. Generally, if you move something, you'll see it vary a bit, even if you don't get rid of it completely. So we've not really come to any improvement via just rearranging the wires alone. So we might have to put a little snubber cap on the phase inverter plate resistor. So we put a 100 picofarad uh, ceramic across R30, which is the phase inverter 100K plate load resistor. And we've got the EQ maxed out. No more oscillation. Um, we've got the blue wire spaced away from the ribbon wire, uh, ribbon cables as much as we could. That did help, but didn't get rid of it completely. And now it's it's gone completely, so that's good. And there's our cute little snubber cap permanently installed. Uh, the leads hooked over the R30 leads and soldered in place very quickly, so we don't affect the solder joints on the bottom of the circuit board. Now you can read the uh, readout up there to the top right hand corner in volts RMS AC and it's just starting to clip there and we're putting out about 10.5 volts RMS into 8 ohms so we can calculate the maximum output power at on onset of clipping with those figures. And that's 10.5 volts uh, RMS squared divided by 8 ohms, 13.8 watts. So, you know, not 15, but it's uh, probably measuring that at pretty high distortion for the, uh, the marketing department to do their thing. <laughs> People like nice round figures, whereas the electronics don't necessarily give you that every time. Uh, so let's... Maybe have a listen, eh? Alright champions, let's give this a quick play. Uh, we'll just start with everything at 12 o'clock, as per usual, except for the reverb. We'll play with that later. But here you can see all the controls, so no need to talk anymore. Let's get on with it.
the end of the day, this is what we're left with. That's all the parts that have been replaced. They go in a bag, like always, and get given back to the customer so they know for their records what we changed. We don't hide anything, anything here or try to keep anything. If people want me to throw it out, that's up to them. Uh, but I return everything to them when they pick up the amp. So another one bites the dust, champions. Hopefully this one will be good for the next 20 years at least and um, the owner will be happy with the sounds that it now is capable of. So uh, take it easy. I'll catch you on the next one as usual.